Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get started with our um, November 17th version of our Gemini Zoom meeting. Thanks for everybody for joining in this morning. Uh, we've got a, a packed agenda today. I sent that out yesterday. <clears throat> It'll be a little different uh, this morning in that we have a representative from Summit Learning, Ashley Prince, who will be on to, to share more about Summit Learning, and I'll preface that in just a little bit. It's been quite a bit of time since our last meeting. I think our last uh, Zoom meeting was October 20th. Um, and, and I do want to provide some updates to the Gemini schools on where the Mercury schools are right now as they approach the end of the semester. Um, I do want to encourage everybody to go ahead and check in through the chat function, if you would, please. Um, and uh, encourage all of you to use the chat function as much as, or as little as possible or as little as you want, I guess I should say. Um, but uh, today, the majority of our time will be spent on Summit Learning, and then at the end, the last 10 minutes or so, I'll, I'll run everybody through where the Mercury schools are um, in, in keeping with our timeline for the Mercury project. So with that, uh, one thing that uh, Tammy and I, and, and Tammy's on vacation today, so you got me flying solo. Um, since October 20th, uh, Brad Neuenswander, myself, and Tammy, we were able to attend. We went down and visited some summit schools in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I was able to uh, go to Memorial Junior High, and um, I believe the name of the elementary that Tammy visited was uh, McClure um, or maybe McCarran. But those two are summit schools in the Tulsa Public Schools District. and. <clears throat> One thing that we found, uh, we, we were put on to Summit Learning earlier this semester and found that the more research we did, the more uh, what Summit Schools proposes as far as a school model for redesign really falls much in line with our bedrock principles for redesign in Kansas. So we wanted to take the opportunity to allow Summit Schools and Ashley Prince to talk to you all today, present Summit Learning. Um, and specifically, we feel like the, the online learning platform, I know many schools through redesign want to personalize learning. And one of the ways that you can do that is to provide an online learning platform for the teachers and the students um, to personalize education. And their, their online platform is very easy to use. And then just the daily and weekly schedule, um, really fits with a lot of the ideas that are coming out of our Mercury schools and, and some of the ideas that you all have espoused before to us in you know, more mentoring, more project-based learning. So I think you'll, you'll find um, today's conversation with uh, Summit Learning to be, to add a lot of value to your own redesign. Um, so I wanna encourage everyone to use the chat function as much as possible. Um, I'm, at this time, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Ashley Prince. And oh, before I do that, um, I did share the link to these slides that Ashley's going to share. Hopefully Ashley can share her screen. Um, Ash, if you wanna try and do that, if not, I can, I can do that as well and just advance the slides as you see fit. But at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Ashley uh, to talk to the group today about Summit Learning. So Ashley, take it away. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I'm so happy to meet all of you this morning. Oh, Ashley, hold on a second. You oh. might be muted. There we go. Now try it. Okay, can you hear me now? Oh, you're still, I, I'm not hearing you. Yes, we can hear her, Jay. I can see you. Oh my gosh, that's a great picture. <laughs> Let's see, let me try to mute and unmute again. Now we can hear you. Oh, good. Okay, great. Well, it's so nice we to meet can, all of you. We can hear you just fine. Perfect. Ashley, um, I've got you unmuted, and it looks like you're unmuted on your end. Is your volume up? Is your speaker working? Yes. And, and, your, and, and your volume is on as well, right? I just want to cover all the bases. <laughs> I think the group you're might good. be able to hear me. You're good. Sorry about that. That's on my end. Everybody else can hear you but me because I didn't turn my speakers up. That is amazing. I make it at least once a day. So <laughs> totally understand. Um, but it's so nice to 
to meet all of you. Uh, my name is Ashley Prince and I'm from the Summit Learning Team. I focus on our growth, so focusing on bringing in new districts and schools all around the country, helping them understand Summit Learning and answer any questions. So happy to present today to the group, but please know that I'm also happy to answer questions after the presentation and go deeper into any part of our approach, including the platform and the demo of the, pl the platform as well. So let me go ahead and share my screen and we can jump right in here. Great. So I always like to start when, when presenting and just thinking about really what our vision is behind the Summit Learning approach. And we developed this vision because we believe it's something that's shared by educators all around the country. And it's that we want to help students feel equipped to lead a fulfilled life. So one that goes just beyond content knowledge and facts, but really is around purpose and financial independence. It's something that goes much more deeper and is holistic. And this really resonated when I was talking to the team um, from Redesigning Kansas, because it seems like there really is a shared vision with you all as well in terms of what it means to truly prepare students for a changing world. So at Summit, we basically are trying to approach this vision in two different ways. Over on the left-hand side, you can see that we are a charter school network that has 11 charter schools in California and Washington. But the other way that we're, that we're approaching this vision, the really um, scalable way, is that we are partnering with schools through the Summit Learning Program. And through this program, we're in 40 states supporting about 330 schools and actually supporting about 60,000 students. And so today I'll be talking to you primarily about that Summit Learning Program, which is the nationwide approach um, to helping schools really personalize learning in their communities. So to take just a quick step back to our own schools, I want to mention that as, I, as we're in these 11 schools that are serving a pretty diverse population that try to reflect the diversity of the communities that we serve. And in those schools, we're really proud that we're having some strong results. So in the 11 schools, 100% of those students are graduating four-year college ready, and 99% of them are accepted to a four-year college. And we've also gotten some exciting awards, awards from folks like the XQ Super School Project and even Fast Company. And basically by seeing the success in our own schools and then also going really deep into the latest research about how students learn best, those two bodies of work have helped us to feel confident in wanting to scale the Summit Learning Program and support more schools around the country. So this is just some of the research that really is behind the approach. And I'm happy to go deeper into any of these relationships, but some examples are that we worked very closely with the Buck Institute to develop our approach to project-based learning. Or we worked very closely with SCALE to understand what it looks like to assess cognitive skills. I worked with the ACT to figure out what it means to be college ready. And when we really dive deep into this research, we realized that there is a lot of science around what it takes to help students achieve the outcomes that we want them to achieve over time. So we are designing to help students achieve four outcomes. We want them to develop cognitive skills. We want them to have content knowledge. We want them to have deep habits of success and then we want them to have a sense of purpose. So those are the outcomes that all of the schools in our program are driving towards. And these pillars are basically the way that students spend their time in order to achieve those outcomes. So students and teachers spend their time in one-to-one -one mentoring, real-world projects, and what we call individualized pathways. And then along the way, this is complicated, we know, to kind of all fit together. So we do a lot of work with schools um, to help them really design a schedule and really just a holistic approach that's going to make sure that there's enough time to drive towards these pillars so that we can achieve these outcomes. I'm going to pause there and just check for, um, for questions quickly on the, on the Zoom. Um, Okay, so no questions yet. I'll be checking periodically, so please feel free to add questions to the chat at any time. So going back to our presentation, I want to dive into the outcomes that we're driving towards. So when we start with cognitive skills, these are really those essential and transferable life skills, the skills that we know students need to be successful, not just in K-12, but through college and career. 
Um, and for us, as I'm sure maybe some of the challenges some of you have faced is that when it comes to cognitive skills, there's not always a clear way to assess. So as part of the program, we have created a cognitive skills rubric with scale to help us understand across disciplines, even across grades, how students are progressing on 36 different cognitive skills. And that allows both students and teachers to understand where students need more support and where students are really um, achieving strong growth. Hey, Ashley. Yes. Sorry to interrupt. Are you just trying to use the slides? Because we're seeing you and not the slides. Not that we don't want to see you. <laughs> oh, no. Okay, let me go right back. Thank you so much for letting me know. Let's see here. Can you see the slides now? Yeah, you're good now. Awesome. Okay. So this is just a helpful picture to describe um, what I was trying to share about and um, how we support cognitive skills development and we develop this cognitive skills rubric with scale to help us be able to assess those 36 different cognitive skills. The second piece around content knowledge, these are just, you know, the, the function and the, and the application of, of, of content that you basically need in order to be successful in college. And we know from the research that you would need a basic level of content knowledge even to be able to assess cognitive skills and apply cognitive skills. Um, so in our support of content knowledge, we're also trying to support and enable critical thinking while helping students to develop this broad knowledge base. The third pillar, or the third outcome rather, is around habits of success. And this is really around that social emotional learning. We work to build these building blocks for learning that are tied to the habits of success. And it helps to th help students think about what they're going to need to develop, whether it's emotional awareness or cultural competence or self-directed learning that will really impact their success in college and career. And then the last outcome that we're diving towards is a sense of purpose. We want students to be able to be self-aware about where they are and where they'd like to go. And we want to ensure that every student has access to a credible path after high school. So what you'll see happening in all Summit Learning schools is a deep dive into mentorship and goal setting, because those are really important tools to help students develop this sense of purpose. So those are the four outcomes that we're driving towards. And the way that we drive towards those outcomes is through spending our time in the three different pillars. So as I mentioned, these pillars are around one-to-one -one mentorship, real-world projects, and individualized pathways. So every school in the Summit Learning Program is going to be spending their time doing these three things, leveraging the platform as kind of a technological backbone to support their work in these three areas. So starting with project time, this is how students actually spend most of their time throughout the week. They are working with their teachers and collaborating with their classmates on these really robust real world projects. And in those projects, they are working to develop cognitive skills. So if you came to one of our schools and saw project time, like you might have seen in Memorial or at McClure, um, you'll see a couple of different things happening. You're going to see students collaborating often in small groups on these real world projects. And as they work on these projects, they'll be applying their content knowledge. And then you will see teachers assessing students based on the cognitive skills rubric, those 36 different skills that are interdisciplinary. And you'll also see the mentors guiding students behind the scenes to make sure that they are doing what they need to do to progress in their projects. The second pillar is around personalized learning time. And this is when students are working through content knowledge at their own pace, using a variety of different curated resources to learn how they learn best. And this is a picture of one of our classrooms. And it's kind of funny because when guests walk in, they often wonder you know, where the teacher is <laughs> right away because they're used to seeing a teacher right at the front of the classroom. But what's happening is the teacher has a lot of data about where each student is. So teachers are using their time a little bit more intentionally and specifically. So as a teacher, I might be working with a small group of students that all have the same challenge. 
I might be doing one-on-one -on -one tutoring to really help one student that's gotten stuck on a particular area of content knowledge, or I even might be lecturing to the whole group, but we call that whole group interruption, because basically you're only lecturing to the whole group if you know from the data that every single student has the exact same concern or the exact same barrier that needs to be addressed. In general, we want to empower students to be self-directed and work at their own pace. So that's what, kind of what I just described where you're seeing all these different things happening in the classroom at the same time. And what's really critical is that when students progress through a certain playlist of content knowledge, they have the opportunity when they're ready to demonstrate that mastery through an on-demand assessment. So students can click in whenever they feel ready and they'll be able to see a 10 question assessment that helps them understand if they've mastered this content or not. And again, after they've mastered it, even once they've mastered it, they're going to come back to it and apply it through project time. But this is a great opportunity to be able to know, here's where I need to focus more of my time, or here's where I'm ready to actually move on because I have this level of mastery achieved. And the last pillar that I'll touch on is around mentor time, which is actually my favorite one. And I think it's kind of our, our secret sauce to the approach. You know, when you talk about personalized learning, you have to really know the person. You have to really know who your students are and what they need and how you can best support them to achieve their, their long-term and short-term goals. So every single student at our Summit Learning Schools receives mentorship one-on-one -on -one at least once a week. And during this time, you're saying, okay, you're working on this project. What can we do today or this week to help set you up to ultimately meet your long-term goals? We're helping to think about how you can make sure that you are mastering content at a pace and in a way that will support your long-term growth. And you're helping them to develop those habits of success and that sense of purpose. So often what you'll see happening is during that time that I just described, individualized pathways, where students are working independently, the teacher will be taking out students one at a time for that one-to-one -one mentorship. And then, of course, it's key that during mentor time, it's often an opportunity to model habits of success. So even to work um, and saying, what does it mean to be self-directed and how are we going to apply that in our work over the course of the week? So let me actually um, pause there again. Well, I'll show you this first. This is just one example of how this might all fit together. And, you know, we have 330 different schools. We probably have 330 different schedules, to be honest. So this is just one example of how it might all work together. So as you can see, most of the time truly is spent in project-based learning where you're developing that, um, that cognitive skills um, against the cognitive skills rubric. Then there's time for these individualized pathways, um, personalized learning time, where you're working through content at your own pace. And then teachers are carving out time for mentor time, where they're checking in with students one-on-one -on -one at least once a week. So let me pause there and see if there are questions. And then I'd love to show you guys the demo, which is really um, how we're able to make all of this work. Let's see. Oh, so there's a question about grade levels. This program is designed to help students in grades four through 12. And that's really because um, we've been able to curate the content at a high level, and then we're also able to have the cognitive skills rubric defined in a way that applies to those age levels. Eventually, we'd love to expand down, but we need to definitely think about how cognitive skills differ in those very, very young grades. And then there's also a question about the needed teacher to student ratio. Yes, that's correct, Jay, grades four through 12. And then there's a question about the needed teacher to student ratio. We honestly have such a range where classes can have, you know, 35 students or they can have 10 students. The ratio that I think um, is, is really critical here um, is around the mentor groups. So we recommend that a, a teacher has no more than 20 students in their mentor group. Um, and that's going to allow you to make sure you can make time to check in with each student at least once a week. So what's, what's key here is that if you are a larger school, um, you may actually bring in some other adults beyond teachers to be mentors. So in some of our schools, the principal, this um, assistant principal, the office manager, the librarian, all of these folks also take on a mentor group. You don't have to be directly teaching content um, to mentor students. And what you'll see and what I'll show you in the platform is that 
you're going to have all this data for any students in your mentor group about where they are. So you can get that really tactical guidance about how to meet your short-term and long-term goals. Um, there's a piece here about making schedules. Yes, we do a lot of assistance there. Um, we know that although we believe in this program, it can be a complicated program to make it all fit together. So we do a lot of thinking with schools um, throughout the winter and spring to help them design a schedule that's going to allow them to achieve all three of those pillars. And then um, all of our schools will come to summer training as well. If there's a three-day school leader training and a four-day teacher training, and that'll be a time when we're going to come together in person and really just you know, dive deep and make sure that folks are really, um, really have a schedule that's going to meet their needs. Um, there's a question about do mentor groups help guide students scheduling? Um, I would say mentor groups definitely guide students in helping figuring out how they spend their time during these chunks of time. So there's a big chunk of time for individualized pathways, for example. What you would want to encourage as a mentor is, okay, what playlists do you want to master today during this time to stay on track? Or what resources do you want to leverage today um, during this time to make sure that you're going to be able to master this content? Or, you know, it may even be during today's time, I'm going to want you to join a small group of other students that are also stuck on understanding photosynthesis because we think that we're going to bring you guys together and that's going to be the most useful thing for you. Um, scheduling can be different weekly or daily as well. Um, so in our schools, for example, our summit charter schools, the 11, folks do individualized pathways all day on Fridays, and they do project time interspersed across Monday through Thursday. So every school has a different schedule. What's, what's, uh, what's aligned across all of our schools is that you're spending time on those three pillars. Oh, and then I missed a question it looks like about um, direct yes. instruction on yes. how, that fits into, how that fits into the model. So it depends school to school. Um, if we're thinking about kind of um, remediation, for example, or we're thinking about um, just kind of helping students to develop those, those, those very basic skills, then sometimes schools have a certain chunk of time throughout the day carved out specifically um, to support um, reading and math. But in general, especially for, especially for math, um, the, this is something that is still approached in that same style where there are projects to support math, there are playlists to support math, and in mentorship, you're helping guide students to how they spend their time in these projects and in these playlists. The interesting thing about math is that we also have something called concept units because we know that math is a, you know, conceptual and requires certain understanding before you can move forward. You can't just necessarily learn in any order as you see fit. So in math, you will see um, the projects, the playlists, but then also the concept units, and I'm happy to show you those in the demo. Um, let's see, there's a question about, um, about, the, about grading. So um, our approach to grading is one that tries to honor the importance of content knowledge, but really emphasizes that we believe cognitive skills are what's most critical for long-term success in students. So um, in our approach, 70% of a student's grade is based on those cognitive skills as assessed by the cognitive skills rubric, and 30% is, um, is based on content knowledge. And for content knowledge, you only can get that 30% when you master content. You know, we want to make sure that we're not moving students along until they have really have that understanding. And so I can show you how that looks on the platform. And then to communicate to parents, we know that that can be a challenge because it's new for parents to understand, you know, how can a student's grade go up overnight? Well, they actually mastered its content that they needed to master, and it's kind of all or nothing in that way. Or, um, what does it mean to be assessed on cognitive skills? So we have a ton of resources and support, everything from letters home to how to do a parent teacher night to, um, to um, a website just for parents to help them understand this approach to grading. And then um, what's important to note is that every single parent 
also is going to have a login to the platform. And it'll look student, similar to the student platform, but you won't be able to take assessments, right? We don't want parents coming in and taking tests and completing projects. But this allows for a lot of transparency so parents can truly understand, you know, what's happening every day and, you know, how is my child learning? Um, how's my child learning across projects and across these, um, across content knowledge playlists? Um, there's a question about is this based on learning competencies? Um, what I would say here, and let me know if this is not answering your question, please, Max, um, is that we're trying to help students understand certainly how they learn best. So what you'll see in the different um, playlists is you're going to see all sorts of different resources. So there will be videos, text-based resources, checks for understanding, um, presentations, more audio, auditory resources, all different things. And what we're wanting to empower students to do is get a little bit meta about how they're learning best. Because, you know, when they leave us and they go to college and they move on throughout life, they're going to understand, okay, I happen to learn history really well when I watch a video and take really careful notes. Or I happen to learn really well when I have the chance to practice teaching it to, some, to another student. Or when I'm able to work in a small group and kind of divide and conquer and discuss. That helps me to learn best. Um, so we want students to, to learn to learn that really authentically, and then be able to apply it outside of the platform. Um, a question about elective courses. So what we think about is we want to make sure that every student um, is using the summit learning approach for the four core subjects: English, math, science, and social studies. Then schools, you know, absolutely can can continue to do their electives as they see fit. So we see pretty classic schedules there, you know, where there's a 45 minute block for dance or for band or for art, um, that sort of thing. The schedule that I showed you basically breaks down how time fits across those three pillars. But you, of course, would imagine that the electives and other courses are also included in the daily and weekly schedules. Okay, so I'm going to pause there and I wanna show you guys the demo and then I promised I would give back 15 minutes at the end. So let me dive into the demo and show you guys um, a little bit about what this looks like behind the scenes. Let's see here. Oh, before I show the demo actually, I wanna just um, make sure that we're clearly highlighting kind of what the, what the program includes overall. So um, first, this is a completely free program. Um, we think it's so important that if you're doing this really hard work of trying to personalize learning for your community, uh, we don't want any barriers to get in the way. So this is a free program, which means that all of the things that I'll describe below are completely free um, to educators for their communities. So what schools in our program get access to um, are really these four things. One is the platform, and I, I do want to emphasize that the platform is meant to be, you know, not the program in itself. It's meant to be um, a tool that helps you to do those things in the approach that I just described. It's meant to be a way to really organize information and connect students and teachers and support the work that you're trying to do as a teacher. Then schools get curriculum and assessment, which actually is grades four through 12 now, and it's standards aligned. You get professional development, and that includes, as I mentioned, that three-day school leader training and four-day teacher training. So we fly all of our educators out to a regional location to receive that training and cover you know, all of the travel and logistics around that travel. And then there's ongoing support. So all of our schools have access to a mentor um, who works with them to guide them all throughout the year. And these are educators that have either been teachers or school leaders in the summit learning approach. So they're really experts in how to make this work in classrooms. So let me go ahead and, and show you the demo actually. And the good thing is um, I can share this demo access to with all of you as well. So I'll just kind of show you a little bit of the highlights, but you can feel free to go in in more detail um, on a later occasion. So if you went to this, you know, on, in your own time, you'll see this page first. You can see this helpful video if you're just showing it to other folks in your community. It's two minutes long, but we'll kind of just guide you through what it looks like, but I'm not going to show you the video because we're doing this live. So I'm going to first show you what it looks like from a student view. So um, when you see a student view, one thing that's cool is that a student can see all of the things that they're going to learn across the course of a whole year. 
So this is built um, in each platform. Each school has their own version of the platform based on their schedule. And what you're seeing with this purple line is where you should be um, in order to be on pace. So at any given time, you want everything to the left of that line to be green so that you've mastered it. Um, and that helps you understand if you're really on track to complete the school year strong. So what you see in the first row um, underneath each subject, because all your cores are here, what you see in the first row are the projects that students are going to be working on throughout the year. And then below, what you see are focus areas. And those are um, where students are going to learn about different types of, of content knowledge. The power focus areas are the content knowledge that we believe you have to be able to master in order just to get to the next grade level. And then additional and challenge focus areas are basically like extra credit. And I should mention that um, for schools that join our program, what you're going to get is kind of this fully loaded curriculum, um, what we call our base curriculum. But every single school can you know, adapt it however they see fit or even create their own. So if you're a science teacher and you're teaching, you know, um, about food webs and energy pyramids, and you say, this is not exactly how I would want to offer these resources, or I want a different description or key terms, completely um, possible for you to change any of the aspects of our curriculum. So we're inside of a focus area now where you're learning content knowledge. And what you're always going to see is a couple of things. You'll see a description, what will students be able to do when they finish this, this playlist? You'll see key terms, what should a student be able to define in order to pass this playlist? And then students have the opportunity first to take a diagnostic assessment. So these are built in to all of our you know, 800 or so playlists that are inside the, the platform. Um, so you take this diagnostic, that's going to allow you to see your pre-knowledge against these three objectives. So it's going to help a student understand, I'm actually pretty strong at identifying types of organisms, but I don't have that much of an understanding about this particular objective around relationships between living things and food webs. So after taking the diagnostic, then if you scroll down, you will see tons of different resources designed to help you understand these objectives. And again, these are what we include because we've created and found them helpful on our curriculum team, but you can always go in, adapt, you know, modify, create your own. So what you'll see here, you know, as I mentioned, videos, websites, all different things. You click into something and it pops up, you know, just right inside the platform so you don't have to hey, leave lucky to understand. Man. Can you get <laughs> this is a very cute video. I'm going to watch it later. <laughs> um, so you'll see all the different resources all throughout. And then once you're ready, once you feel like you've mastered this, you're going to request a content assessment. And that's your chance to demonstrate your mastery of this particular focus area. So that's how it looks in the on the student view. And then as a teacher, what you're going to be able to see um, once it loads here for us is that um, for a particular focus area, so we're looking at food webs again, um, you can see, OK, here are, for each objective, here are the resources that I think are best. If you want to add a new one, super simple, just to go in right here, add the title, you know, add the link or upload it from your computer, and it's going to live inside the platform for your students. Um, if you want to create a different objective, you can add a different objective for this playlist. Um, and you can create a lot of different assessment questions. So in the platform, um, an assessment itself includes 10 questions, but we're always going to include more than 10 questions because we don't want kids to be able to game the system, right? Just click right through and, and if they get it wrong, just keep trying, keep trying on the same questions. So that allows um, students to really, each time they take an assessment, if they're taking it multiple times, have access to different questions designed to help them meet the different objectives. And then what you're gonna see for your, for your students is um, and as a teacher on a high level view, you can start to dive deep into how your students are progressing on these different focus areas or playlists. So what I could see in this kind of um, tiny demo is that um, there's a couple of my students who have mastered many, many focus areas. And there's a couple of my students that are actually behind 
And this little bar basically tells you how many you should have mastered by now. So if I'm a mentor especially, and I'm mentoring Kathy C, I know that I need to help her get back on track in science. And I know that I need to do so by really helping her think through how she can focus on these two playlists, mastering these two playlists. We need a plan there to help her get back on track in science. So that's just a very quick preview um, of how the focus areas look. I also wanna show you how projects look very quickly. So we're going back to this this year view. And what you're gonna see is these different projects, the top line. And as a reminder, these projects are designed to help students develop their cognitive skills, right? So in every project, you're gonna see an essential question, an enduring understanding, and a description. This is all built in. And again, like before, you can adapt anything and everything. So the project has this info, and then every single project has a final product. What are you going to be assessing as a teacher at the end of the project? So for this bioremediation project, you can see that their final product is a lab report. And common types of final products can include, um, you know, Socratic seminars, essays, group presentations, lab reports, all different things. So to get the final product, there is scaffolding involved, right? So we call that scaffolding checkpoints. These are the things that students are going to do along the way in order to be able to ultimately submit a final product. And you can actually assign different checkpoints to different kids. So if you have one student and the final product is an essay and they need more support, maybe you assign a checkpoint about um, filling out an outline for that essay and sending that to you for feedback. But maybe another student can just go right ahead and write that essay. So what you see as a student is all these different checkpoints that you're working on, and um, which one you're working on currently. And as you complete a particular checkpoint, you can go ahead and request feedback from your teacher right inside the platform. Um, it's also important to note that inside the platform against each of these checkpoints, there's also resources. So for this one, as soon as write their lab report materials, there's all different act, um, activities and resources that help them to complete their checkpoints along the way. And what you're going to see is for a particular project, what are the cognitive skills that we want kids to be focusing on? So for this bioremediation project, they're applying knowledge around cells and food webs and photosynthesis, and that's really important. But we also really care about the fact that as they could submit this lab report, they're growing in the cognitive skills of asking questions or hypothesizing or designing processes and procedures. So to quickly show you the teacher view of a project, um, what you're going to see along the way, again, you'll have that ability to edit every single piece here from the info to the checkpoints along the way and how they're assigned to students, to the focus areas of knowledge that, that the project is building on. Um, and then you're going to be able to see some student requests for feedback. So as I showed you before, when, when kids are requesting feedback on different checkpoints, it's gonna pop up over here. So I'm gonna know that on this project, Bobby B requested feedback around this checkpoint for lab report materials. And I can go right in and see his work that he submitted, and I can offer that feedback just instantly and then be able to, sh to share that with Bobby automatically. So it's really quick feedback back and forth. Um, and then I'll be able to see over time, you know, how students are doing in their cognitive skills, each one way to the project, so I can know where kids might be a little bit more attention or a little bit more guidance. I want to show you one more thing in the demo so that we don't get overwhelmed, and then I'm going to just pause for a few more questions. The last piece, because it's my favorite piece, and I think it's so critical, is, is really around really around the mentorship. So there's a lot of a lot of support that's going to help students be able to um, set these short-term and long-term goals. So in addition to all of the data that you're going to see as a mentor or as a mentee in terms of how you're doing in your projects and your content knowledge playlist, there's also these places to record long-term and short-term goals and even put in some reflections. So what's critical about this is that as a teacher, as a mentor, 
you're going to be able to set goals with students and say, okay, you have this goal of getting an A in math too. Let's take a look and see, you know, how we're progressing towards that goal. What activity have you been doing in math too recently? How is that going? We can think about, you know, if your goal is an A, but you're actually behind in two focus areas, we are off track to meet that goal. And we can dive deep with these students and say, okay, in math in these two focus areas, um, you know, what's happening yet? We can see, have you tried to take an assessment yet? Um, if so, you know, what, what, did we, what did we miss there? Have you not even tried yet? What's behind that? There's so much rich data um, here that helps you to understand, you know, just how best to support your students. So you can see that, you know, as a mentor for your different student groups, this, this, this was my mentee group, I could understand, you know, where are they needing more support in their projects and cognitive skills, where are projects overdue, how are focus areas coming along, and really target of how I support my mentees. So let me, let me take a peek now at questions over here. Let's see. Um, so there's a question, what happens when a student decides to test but doesn't pass it? So that is something that is completely okay. That's an opportunity for us to think about what went wrong. So your quest assessment, you don't, you don't master it. What is that going to look like? Um, it will look something like this. Um, and so imagine I've taken this assessment and I need an eight out of 10 to pass and I got a sub. If that occurred, I'm going to see which questions I got right and wrong against which objective. So as a mentor, I would guide a student to think about, okay, if you didn't pass, it's because you actually didn't have a good understanding of this particular objective, identifying the time sequence. So let's develop a strategy. How are you going to go deeper on that objective before taking the next assessment that you're going to have a better chance of passing the next time? Um, and, that's, and that's a really critical process in terms of being self-directed. You know, you set a goal, you try to achieve that goal, you demonstrate your mastery, you try to demonstrate mastery. If you do pass, that's a good opportunity for conversation. What did you do to help you be able to, to master this? If you didn't, that's also a good opportunity to learn. Did you actually take notes when you went through this particular objective? Did you spend time on these resources? Um, have you considered asking a friend who's already mastered this objective to help you before you take this assessment again, to help you really dive deep? Have you gone up to, up to me and asked for additional help? All these different things um, are made possible when you have the data and you're allowing students you know, another opportunity after they don't pass the first time. Um, there's a question about, um, would a single teacher be a mentor of all students' content areas? That's a good question, and it depends school to school, but I, I will say that um, that's typically what happens. So let's say I'm a, I'm a, I'm a history teacher, and that what that means is that I am facilitating during my history class the history projects, and I may have a mentee group of just all of the, uh, there's a variety of seventh graders, and when I work with that mentee group, I'm going to understand how they're progressing in all of their subjects. Um, and what's interesting about this, and what we think is actually kind of cool about this, is you're not you know, a science expert necessarily. So you have the opportunity to say, okay, what are the strategies that we can do to help, to help you meet your, your goals in science without being the one to necessarily guide them? So as a mentor, you're saying, um, if you're behind in science, what are you going to do with your science teacher? What's your strategy to progress here? Um, and helping them to be a little bit more self-directed and really own that learning as someone that's a guide, but not necessarily someone that's gonna provide all the answers all the time across all subjects. Um, there's a piece about how do we address learning gaps in students. Um, I think it's kind of a two-part answer. One, the, the things that you are already doing to address learning gaps, we don't want great teaching to stop, right? So we want people to ha that have a strong approach to addressing learning gaps and you know, scaffolding and IEPs. Those things have to continue. But there's also some support inside the platform for sure. So um, when, you, when you look in the platform, um, 
and I'll do this quickly. I know I promised I'd stay 15 minutes at the end, but there's all of the curriculum um, for all grade levels exists. So if I had a student um, that was not able to really um, really access the English six content, maybe I would recommend that we go back into, into English five and I would might recommend and or assign a particular focus area to help them build that base knowledge specifically for that student because I know that they might need that, that extra support um, before they get to the sixth grade knowledge. So that's one really helpful piece that allows you to, to bring in content from you know, earlier grades if the student's not actually quite ready to, to work on the content that's um, assigned for this grade. Um, okay, there is a question about parent-teacher conferences. That's a good question. Um, I can definitely send you a couple of different approaches to what parent-teacher conferences look like, but that's exactly right, that oftentimes it is the mentor that's, that's involved in that conference because they're going to be kind of the expert on the student across all grade levels and also beyond content knowledge into their sense of purpose and their habits of success. Um, let's see. Um, there's a question, let's see, did I miss a question here? Oh, social studies. So I can show you in a couple of, a couple of different ways. Um, so one, you'll be able to see, you can see all of the curriculum here. Um, if you wouldn't mind adding a particular um, grade level that I can see or subject, I can go ahead and click on that and happy, happy to show you what that looks like for social studies. Um, let's see. But if you're just kind of curious in general, this is what um, a social studies class might look like, Modern World 2. Um, you're going to see projects, and you're going to see the cognitive skills that are assessed, addressed with each project. You're going to see the focus areas. Um, and similarly, each of those is going to have a particular set of objectives that you click into those. Against those objectives, you'd see the associated resources and questions. Um, and then you're going to see the standards that these are tied to. One thing I should mention is that during summer training, a big part of what we do, and even before, but during summer training, we will think about what the particular standards are for your particular community. So, for example, I'm from Texas, um, and they don't use Common Core in Texas. We use TEKS. Um, so there's a lot of crosswalking around what's in our curriculum that's Common Core aligned and NGSS aligned, and what you're particularly driving towards in your school, and then kind of crosswalking in the curriculum to see what's there and what needs to be modified um, to really start out this school year strong. Um, does our curriculum include foreign languages? Yes, right now our curriculum includes Spanish for high school. So if you look at our curriculum, you will see um, Spanish for 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grades. And in 12th grade, it's gonna be an AP Spanish language. Um, there is a question, okay, are products designed intentionally to be cross-curricular? Um, so it depends on the projects. Some projects are, are pretty focused on one particular, particular discipline. So you see that in science, for example, sometimes, where it's really just a science project. But um, there are also projects that really more, are more interdisciplinary. So you'll see some work, for example, around the humanities that's, that's really more designed to bring in um, content knowledge from a few different subjects. Um, and then the thing that I think is so cool is that because you can modify curriculum, if you feel that you want honestly, more, more cross-curricular. We have schools doing incredible things and creating new projects that really blend disciplines in ways that are so creative and cool. So that's definitely a possibility. Um, my favorite question just came up, which is how is this all free? It always comes up at least once, so I appreciate when, it, when it's asked. I feel like, okay, we got to all the, all the critical stuff. Um, the short answer is that we are a nonprofit, so in public schools. And as a nonprofit, you know, we do a ton of fundraising um, and work to really make sure that we're able to offer this complete program for free. Um, then we also have, and that, and some of our major donors include folks like the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and the Gates Foundation. Um, but just like any nonprofit, you know, we are generating, you know, donations from different funders um, and grants and that sort of thing. Um, what's also helpful to us is that we have an engineering team that lives at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. So these are folks that are working full time on the platform and making it better at no cost to Summit. 
So that allows us to be able to keep building this platform, iterating on this platform with really top-notch engineers without paying the cost of, you know, an engineering team in, in that classic way that um, another platform might need to. Um, let me see if I missed any questions here. Let's see. Oh, okay. Is it up to the mentors and a data transfer student? So I know this is a question to answer, but it looks different in every school. Um, I, I, what I often see happening, so when we have, we definitely have processes and we have, you know, resources and documents that we would share with you about what it looks like to transfer, because of course it happens in, in education. What I see often happen is the mentor takes on kind of a project manager role of integrating students in. So they're not doing all of the all of the actual execution, but they're project managing the approach. So it's sitting down with the student, and maybe the student's coming in tenth grade, and I'm saying, okay, we're doing geometry this year. The, um, we're sitting together and we're thinking, okay, do you have a sense of actually um, some of these concept units that we cover for geometry? Have you covered these at, at your at your previous school? Are there opportunities where we can just kind of know that you've already mastered certain content right away? Because if you've already spent a lot of time on, you know, congruence in your previous school, then as a student, we might just be able to say, let's just go ahead and real quick, um, let's go ahead and take that assessment, you know, right away because we've already mastered it. And then we'll know that all these things can already be green. Or let's bring what you've learned at your old school. Um, and then the individual subject teachers, of course, but still need to play a role in just making sure that the student not only feels culturally comfortable, but also um, is really diving deep on, on what they need. Um, let's see, do you have to commit to the full program as assigned? So, so we do ask schools to commit to the full program in order to be a summit learning partner school. And um, when I say full program, that really means that in at least one grade level or a portion of a grade level, um, you are really doing all four core subjects, English, math, science, and social studies, and you're participating in the three pillars, the mentoring, the project-based learning, and the individualized pathways. So that, that is the commitment that we ask of schools. Um, and we do that because we've done a lot of work with some outside research groups, including GMMB and FSG, and it helps to understand that these pieces really are designed to go together and to have a strong launch and really, you know, ensure success or, or work as much as we can towards success, it's important to be on the same page around these things. And also creates a lot of cohesion for teachers um, and for students and allows teachers to collaborate together. So we do ask that commitment, um, that full commitment of schools that are partnering with us. Um, are there guidelines for schools to have their pre-K through third grade that's a good question, and unfortunately, I don't think that there, that there are guidelines, but I can double check with our PD team, and I'll make a note to see if there's anything that we, that we do have that helps folks get on track to better enter the program. Um, are there only platforms for the four subjects, or can eligible teachers have a platform for their classes as well? It's a good question. Um, so you can certainly add your own subject into the platform, but because the way that this platform is built, um, it's really well designed if the elective course also has that structure around projects and the content knowledge focus playlist. So we've had teachers build out, you know, yoga and all these different electives, computer science, different things. But if you're trying to build out a, a, an elective that really is not designed to have students master content knowledge and then progress through projects, um, it's, it's not as strong of, of a fit, to be honest. So I think that might be all of the questions. I know I said I give you 15 back, but I only give you six minutes back. Um, but I would just want to note again, I'll make sure that you all have my email address and access to the demo on the slides. Please feel free to reach out as you have more questions. It's a lot to process. And our team honestly loves to talk about summit learning. So you can always reach out and we're happy to help however we can. Well, Ashley, it sounds like we need to bring you back every every other week for these Zoom meetings because you just answered um, probably 10 times the number of questions we've answered through this, um, through these Zoom meetings. But no, uh, just an excellent, um, an excellent presentation, lots of interest out there. Um, I just want to reiterate that we feel like this is a really nice fit with redesigning Kansas. 
as far as a system, it is an option. Um, Ashley, can you talk to you talk to the non-negotiables as far as this four? Uh, what do you call those four student skill areas? What do you call those? Well, we call them our our four outcomes. Four and outcomes. The, the three pillars that students are doing to help achieve those four outcomes. Right. Could you also talk about anything with the uh, other non-negotiables, like maybe one to one? Sure. So yes. Yeah. So students do need to have their their own device, um, typically a laptop or a Chromebook. Um, and that's just because it's, you know, it's difficult to bring us to the platform without, without the technology required. Um, our schools in the program are also adhering to the grading clause that we discussed, that 70% um, projects, cognitive skills, 30% knowledge. Those are really the critical And then, of course, it's happening, you know, in the four core subjects um, in a full grade level team. So that, across those, across the set of teachers. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time. Um, uh, there's one more, one more uh, question there. What are our costs to implement Summit Learning in our districts? Sure, so it really is a, a free program. And when I rack my brain to think about what costs might look like, um, if the school doesn't have devices yet, um, the school would need to acquire devices. Um, and then um, throughout the school year, we have these regional convenings. Again, we fly, we fly everyone in as part of the program to come to these convenings for two days to kind of dive deep on instruction. If you have to cover substitutes while those teachers are away with us on training, that could be a cost that could pop up. But those are only the things, the only things that I can really think about, honestly. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much for your time, Ashley. There, ho hopefully, you're open to a, maybe another another time to come back with this group um, if, if if that's the 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 wants of the group. Um, thank you so much for all the wonderful information, and everything about Summit Schools. We really appreciate your time. Sure, of course. And again, please feel free to reach out anytime with more questions, and I'm happy to come back and do large group as well. Excellent. Thanks. All right, I'll see you hopefully soon. Yeah. Um, so, and, and thank you to everybody that's participated today and all the wonderful questions. Um, a lot of the questions that were popping up, those were the very same questions that, that, that I was thinking in my mind. I know Tammy and, and Randy and, and Brad and I have talked through some of the very similar questions that, that all of you have had. Um, but uh, if, if you look at those, the, the four outcomes of, of Summit Learning, they really align well with the, the, the five um, areas of a successful high school graduate. And so a lot of our schools are interested when they see that those, uh, you know, cognitive skills, content knowledge, habits of success, and sense of purpose, those align really well with, with uh, the goal areas of a lot of our schools that are redesigning. So um, I think there's a lot of potential with Summit Learning and Summit Schools. And I know there's quite a few um, other questions out there that need to be answered, but uh, it was a great start today. So we do have one other question. Uh, what schools did you go to in Tulsa, Max? We went to Memorial Junior High in Tulsa and then McClure Elementary. And uh, Memorial is a 7-8 building and McClure, I believe, is a K-6. And McClure feeds into Memorial. Um, you know, as far as taking a trip down there, uh, it was great to see the Summit online learning platform. They had a different schedule. Um, I know Ashley put up that schedule, and, and that's the other thing about Summit Learning is, you know, they have their non-negotiables, but pretty much virtually everything you saw today, for the most part, is customizable. And so Memorial took a different approach with, with their schedule. Um, and it's an approach that I wasn't very comfortable with, and a lot of the questions today were about that. It's electives. Uh, Memorial Junior High is a school that is on improvement, has been on improvement for many years, and their their state assessment scores in math and reading are, are you know, to their own admission, not good. And so they spend a lot of their time on a daily basis focused on math and reading to the detriment of kids' choice on the courses they take. I think at Memorial, they had um, one elective. And so that, of course, that raised some red flags, but it, it's, it's, they're using it for what works for them. Um, so, but, but that would be a school, um, seven, eight building. Um, 
uh, you know, as far as the, I can, I can get you all the information on demographics, all those kinds of things, if anyone's interested. I am going to share this recording. Um, absolutely. So each, each of these meetings is recorded and as well as the, the chat is copied. And so once we post the recording on YouTube, you can go back and look at this. You can see the, you can see the chat, you can see the, con uh, the conversation going on through that. So Chris, definitely we will share this recording. Um, and Rachel asked his information about what you learned on the Padlet. There is one broad topic and I can just go to that um, here. Let me uh, share my screen. And so on the Padlet under resources, there is some uh, summit information, I believe, that we have posted. I may be proven wrong. There we go. Summit learning platform. Um, and I've asked that question before about can you just use the learning platform and not be a summit school? And the answer that summit learning is telling us is no, you have to apply to be a summit school. And then all the PD, all those things that are free um, flow behind that along with the learning platform. But you can go in, uh, we've demoed the, the learning platform. There's just, just what um, Ashley pretty much showed today. And it's very user friendly. Um, Memorial Junior High, the students and staff that we talked to really liked it. The students love the line. They like to see where they're, they're able to track their own progress at their own pace. So, but yeah, there's a Summit Learning Platform is on the Padlet and there'll be more as we move forward um, uh, posted to the Padlet. Uh, just back to the, the chat, are there any high schools close that are using Summit Learning? Um, we don't think so. Um, the, there were no high schools in the Tulsa area that were, was using Summit Learning. There are some high schools in Denver that are using Summit, but they are charter schools. They're not public schools. So, um, but I have heard, and I hate bringing this up because, um, you know, I'd appreciate everybody's discretion on contacting this school, but I have heard that Park Hill, Missouri has started a Summit Learning School I think it's an alternative school, but it is public. And I think what I heard was they retrofitted an old executive building there in North Kansas City, and it's an alternative school, but they are using, the, they are a summit school, but they're in their first year, so they may not be to the point where they can allow people to come in and look at what they're doing. So um, we, we're going to research that further and, and provide that information at a time when that school is ready to start sharing what, what's going on. So. But yeah, a lot of the high schools are, uh, other than charter schools, there aren't too many that are at least close to us. Are there other questions about Summit Learning? There'll be more to come. Um, if you all feel that was valuable um, and want to learn more, we'll, we'll continue to provide that information. Um, that presentation that Ashley just completed, we'll be completing that with the, with the Mercury schools on Monday. So uh, that was a firsthand look at Summit Learning. So um, let, let us know if you need any more, if you have any other questions, things like that. I'll just close real quickly with a brief update on where the Mercury schools are right now. We just completed our fifth round of, of school visits with the Mercury schools um, last week. And um, Right now, you, you know, uh, if, if you've been following along, that they are all, uh, they've all established their why. They've answered the reason why they want to redesign. They've established a shared vision and vetted that vision through multiple stakeholder groups. They have also come up with their what, uh, their goal areas and, and student skill areas, much like Summit's um, four outcomes, they've established their goal areas. And now they're to the point where they've established investigation teams for each of those goal areas. And that's the point at which they're broadcasting that and engaging the wider staff in these buildings now. A lot of the work to this point has been done within the redesign team. And now they are going out to the wider staff and saying, here are our goal areas. Um, 
you know, what are your first and second options of, of as far as goal areas that you would like to help and be part of an investigation team? So the Mercury schools are now in the process of developing and, and, and getting them up and running these investigation teams for their goal areas. And what those investigation teams are charged with doing is further defining that goal area. Let's say it's social emotional readiness for their students. They're further defining that. Um, they are identifying different redesign elements or in the 40X language lead measures that can really leverage things that you would add into your system that would really leverage social emotional skill development in your students. And then they're coming up with a pilot process and they're gonna pilot those, um, those different redesign elements in January and February. And so those investigation teams are working through that right now. Um, one example from one of our schools is a breakfast club. So they've identified students that don't feel have a, a strong sense of belonging to their school. And they're, so they're bringing those students in, they're feeding them breakfast, which works for everybody. And um, they're having just informal conversations. And that, um, so that's been very uh, impactful for those students. And they've also collected data to show that those students are more engaged, their daily attendance is up, and they are interacting more uh, and feeling that greater sense of belonging during the school day on a, on a more consistent basis. So just an example there, but that's really where the Mercury schools are, investigation teams and developing a pilot um, process for the different redesign elements starting in January and February. Um, are there any questions about where the Mercury schools are, the, the process, any of those things? And I know we're over time, so I know that probably means that there are no questions. If you do have some questions, please feel free to stay on. Um, if you have some uh, questions you wanna dive a little further into. But our next meeting for the Geminis will be Friday, December 1st at 1030 through Zoom again. Um, and until that time, everybody have a great weekend and happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Thanks for your time.